So Shep, Jason and I talk a lot about how our expectations can shape our experiences. Do you know if there are ways that expectations can even shape our physiological experiences? Sure, expectations is affective physiological experiences all the time. If you uh, expect to eat a meal because it's the time of day when you normally eat a meal or you're in an environment in which you normally eat a meal or preparations for cooking are being done, you're secreting insulin, your, gall your gallbladder is, is contracting to eject bile into your gastrointestinal system. So your physiology is changing in anticipation of a physiologically significant event all the time. Okay, so that, that's, that's an example from food. Are there any other examples from our everyday life where that happens? Uh, if you expect to take a drug, you make responses that prepare you for a drug, or just like you make responses in anticipation for food that prepares you for food. Okay, so how, how, does, that, how does that mechanism work? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean you're expecting and how do you know what to expect from a drug? Well. If you're in an environment in which, uh, to, to take a common example of somebody who has um, a cocktail in the evening when they come home from work. Many people report that if on some peculiar occasion they drink the same amount of alcohol at lunchtime, for example, they get more intoxicated mm. than if they drink it in the evening. Mm -hmm. And that's because the usual cues for the alcohol that cause them to prepare for the alcohol are not present in the afternoon because they haven't normally drunk at that time, whereas in the evening they are present. So the effect of the drug is more pronounced if you don't prepare for it than if you do prepare for it. And that's been seen with many effects of many drugs. But I still don't understand. It's, it's exactly the same. Say we're in a highly controlled situation. I'm taking exactly the same amount of alcohol. Right. How can I get more drunk? It's, it's the same amount of the drug, but it it's, well, has a completely different effect. If you take a drug, effect. any drug, what it does is engenders responses that attenuate the effect of the drug in order to keep you in a normal homeostatic state. So if the drug causes your blood vessel diameter to increase, for example, there'll be parasympathetic so sympathetic activity that causes the, the blood pressure diameter to decrease. If the drug causes your heart rate to increase, that will the, the increased heart rate will initiate homeostatic responses that so when will you, decrease so, heart so rate. So I don't understand. So are you saying homeostatic response? What does that mean? Are you, are you saying your body is, is, your is bo you're yes. doing this? We can only survive in an extraordinarily narrow range of physiological parameters. If, I, if we get too hot, if we get too cold, if the potassium concentration in our blood gets beyond certain limits, we get sick and then we die. And we have this elaborate homeostatic machinery, which was first elaborated by Claude Bernard and later by Walter Cannon, that acts to keep us, that, that when something happens that disturbs the our internal environment such that we, in, in a way that's, that's uh, uh, contrary to what we need to survive, that initiates responses that counter that effect, and these are the homeostatic responses. And a drug is certainly can be a major physiological insult, and the reason why you don't die when you get the drug is because the perturbations that are produced by the drug induce responses that counter the effects of these internal disturbances. Okay, so I can imagine that this same kind of uh, phenomenon would affect things like overdoses. So I think my intuitive idea of what an overdose is, um, is if I take too much of a drug, if I, if I inject too much heroin than I normally do, then I will die. Is yeah. that the way overdoses That's right. work? So if you do inject too much of a drug, you will die. But the interesting fact about overdoses of many drugs, and especially heroin, is that these very drug experienced and presumably very drug tolerant individuals die after receiving a dose of the drug that would not be expected to kill them. You could document, for example, that many people buy a drug from a common drug supply, uh, from a common supplier, and they all inject about the same amount of the drug, and only one individual will suffer the overdose, and the others not only don't suffer an overdose, but don't see anything particularly unusual about the drug on that occasion. You can find uh, instances in which an individual died after self-administering a dose of the drug that you can demonstrate was a smaller dose than they survived the previous day. 
so it's it, it's not an overdose, and this has been known for a long time as as the as the term is usually used. It's, a, it's some peculiar idiosyncratic reaction to the drug that's suffered by the victim, and the reason why it occurs is because they don't make the compensatory response in anticipation of the drug. Why wouldn't they make the compensatory response in anticipation of the drug? It's because on the occasion of the overdose, they get the drug in unusual circumstances. This has certainly been demonstrated in several experiments with uh, animals concerning overdose to heroin, pentobarbital, and alcohol, in that the drug experienced rat or mouse that gets the drug in an environment other than that previously paired with the drug is likely to suffer an overdose. It's also been demonstrated with people. Of course, it, you can't do the experiments with people that you can do with animals, mm -hmm. but there are many, many case reports of individuals who suffer an overdose when they take the drug in circumstances for them which are unusual, and that would be expected if they don't make the drug preparatory response. And of course, there is as, as one well-known study uh, done in, in Barcelona, where they um, looked at admissions to a hospital for heroin overdose. If you're admitted to a hospital, you're going to survive the overdose because you're given a drug called an opiate antagonist that displaces the opiate molecule from its site of action in the brain. And so you survive. So you can question the individual about their drug use on the occasion of the overdose. And so what they looked at in this Spanish hospital were people who were admitted for heroin overdose and survived, and they could question them about the, what the circumstances of drug administration were on the occasion of the overdose. But they also had people admitted to the hospital for any of a variety of reasons that people get admitted to the hospital, uh, fights on the street, automobile accidents, other uh, traumatic events having nothing to do with drug use, but you can <coughs> evaluate blood levels of morphine, which is what heroin is converted to when it's administered, and you have another group of people that have recently taken heroin but were admitted to the hospital at, at about the same time as the overdose victims, but not for heroin overdose for some yep. other reason. And the people that were admitted for heroin overdose tended to take the drug in unusual circumstances. Mm -hmm. Remember, they could be uh, revived by give, be given the opiate antagonist and question about it. And the people with about the same blood levels of opiate who were admitted to the hospital but didn't suffer an opiate overdose and so were tolerant to the drug, yep. uh, were, were, um, so, were, they took it in their usual place on that occasion. So it seems you need to be careful um, if you're engaging in this sort of behavior. Yeah. Uh, you, you, might, you might be about to take the same physical amount of a drug. But That's if you're right. in a new environment or a new situation, yes. then uh, it's going to affect you differently. And so that, so my, question, yeah. my question would be, yeah. uh, making no value judgments about whether they right. should or should be engaging in this behavior, what advice would you have for young college students who uh, need to get drunk quickly uh, at, with, with the lowest amount of money <laughs> based well, on, well, on wanna, that research? If you want to get drunk quickly, then you should drink your beverage in circumstances that for you are unusual. And so there was an experiment that was done some years ago that showed that college students get more intoxicated drinking the same amount of alcohol in a novel, in a novel peppermint flavored blue beverage than they do if they drink it in a beer flavored and colored beverage. So just by changing the color and the flavor of the beverage, it causes more intoxication. Indeed, we recently wrote a paper showing that there is one beverage that's widely sold, at least in North America, called Four Loco, F-O-U-R-L-O-K-O, that has been implicated in many cases of alcohol poisoning, especially among college students. Mm -hmm. And what Four Loco is, is a beverage that's doesn't have very high alcohol content, about the same as a bottle of wine, about 12% alcohol, but it's presented in very novel flavors that in the past have not been paired with alcohol. So sort of confectionery flavors, uh, a watermelon flavor, mm -hmm. or uh, other flavors that apparently defy description, but they're, they're um, novel flavors for alcohol. And so, um, and, and also, the perhaps 
the manufacturers of this beverage realize they know about the effect the, yeah. the effect because they introduced a product some years ago called Four Loco XXX Limited Edition. And what Four Loco XXX does is change the flavor every four months. Yep. So the idea is that if you're used to drinking watermelon Four Loco, uh -huh. then perhaps um, you would you would subsequently get um, lemon lime Four Loco. Yeah. And so even though you would eventually form an association between watermelon flavor and alcohol, when you switch to this other flavor, it would again have an intoxicating effect. So am I right in saying that, um, that your body, say, doesn't have a chance to learn uh, about the new flavor and therefore compensate for the effect of alcohol? That's right, until so you, you never have it learn. on a number of occasions. Yeah, I understand. That's right. Is there any lab-based evidence for the difference you were talking about between uh, experiencing a drug in one situation versus another? Yeah. It's been demonstrated with heroin, with a barbiturate, pentobarbital, and with alcohol. I'll describe the heroin experiment to you. There are a large number of rats that were prepared with intravenous cannula. That is, they could be administered a drug through a vein without actually piercing the skin with a hypodermic needle all the time. Okay. And these rats were injected with heroin once every other day on a gradually increasing scale. As, uh, that is, the dose would be gradually increasing each day, so they built up the tolerance to it. So they'd get a small dose on day one, a somewhat larger dose on day three, a somewhat larger dose on day five. Yep. On those days when they weren't administered heroin through the vein, they were administered an inert substance through their vein. Uh, uh, a, a, a saline. A saline. 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 Yep. It was a sugar solution, Salt, which, was sugar, the, sugar solution which was the vehicle for the heroin. And on those alternate days when they got the sugar solution, it was done in a different environment. So there were two different rooms, imagine. Yep. Imagine. That differed along several dimensions. And so for, on, imagine on odd number days, they got heroin in a heroin room. And on even number days, they got saline in a saline room. Yep. The, the, the exact rooms, of course, are counterbalanced. Yep. And then on a final test session, everybody gets a large dose of heroin but half the rats get the large dose of heroin intravenously in the environment where they previously got heroin, in the heroin room. The other group gets the large dose of heroin in the saline room, in the, in the sugar room, the, the room that was previously paired with the vehicle. Is there any, is there any physical difference between those two rooms? Or well, is it just that they, no, they, they received it in, in those there's rooms? There's a physical difference in the terms of different sizes, different odors, different... But, but it's counterbalanced. What was the sugar room for half the rats was the heroin room for the okay, other half okay. the rats. Okay, so it doesn't matter. The, 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 right. the, the environment in the two rooms doesn't so matter. So prior to that final test session, you have two groups of rats that got the same doses of heroin equally often and at the same intervals. But the rats that got heroin in the sugar room died as a result of this final dose of heroin. And the rats that got heroin in their usual heroin environment tended to survive. So it's the same thing as the Barcelona study. People that self-administer heroin where they expect heroin tend to survive. People that administer heroin where they don't expect to receive heroin tend to die. So what's the, ex what's the explanation for that? If you are in an environment that you previously have not gotten heroin, you don't make the conditional homeostatic response that's going to attenuate the effect of the drug. So, You're your, not so your, body doesn't, drug your, your body doesn't prepare for the, right. for, the, for the assault of the drug exactly. when you've learned it in one situation right. versus another. Yeah, and it, it's not just with heroin, it's with anything, with coffee. There's a more recent study in which experienced coffee drinkers um, drank espresso, a strong coffee, and you measured uh, blood pressure and uh, these experienced coffee drinkers, it had almost no effect on blood pressure. You take these same people and give them the caffeine intravenously, and you do it in a way that mimics the blood levels of caffeine that they got when they ingested the espresso, which you were measuring all the time. Okay. So it's a slow intravenous drip designed to mimic the same blood levels of okay. caffeine that they had when they injected 
Okay. The the um, see the the uh, caffeine normally. Yep. And what you find is that it has a dramatic effect on blood pressure. So are these people tolerant to caffeine, these experienced coffee drinkers? It depends. It depends on whether they get it where they expect it, that is, drinking coffee. So they have all the cues that in the past have been paired with caffeine, the sight of the coffee, the smell of the coffee, the distinctive temperature of the coffee, or do they get it in a way that eliminates these cues that have been paired with caffeine, that is presenting it intravenously. Interesting. So what would happen if you uh, accidentally took decaffeinated coffee? Or you, uh, you took decaffeinated coffee and you weren't expecting it? Uh, that, that, what would happen? That's a fascinating question. What, what I would expect, and this is a, a, an experiment that I certainly would encourage people to do, if you are an experienced coffee drinker, and by the way, what, what I assert will happen is what people tell me anecdotally do happen. And you, on some particular occasion, get decaffeinated coffee when you normally get caffeinated coffee. It should have a soporific effect because you would prepare for the activating effects of the caffeine and there would be no caffeine there and you would have a conditioned response, which would be sleepiness. So, sorry, what do you mean by soporific? So you get very sleepy. Okay. Just like caffeine causes you to be alert, the anticipation, the reason why the experienced coffee drinker is not hyperactive when they have coffee is because all these cues elicit a response that counter the effects of the coffee. The but but shouldn't, shouldn't I, if I don't get that, that caffeine, I just have decaf, shouldn't I just feel a little bit down? Why would yeah. I go to the other end and get well, sleepy? Well, yeah, you'd feel a little bit down in a, a dramatic way. It would be you, you get sleepy. That is, it should produce a... a Whatever caffeine produces in the body that counters the effect of caffeine, that's uh, what decaffeinated coffee should do. Okay, so my body is, is pushing me down expecting a caffeine hit, that's right. but it doesn't get it, so, and so it not, I don't stay at a normal level. Right. I'm, I'm, I've been pushed down, that's right. but I don't get the actual drug that, to pull exactly. me back up to the middle. That's right, exactly. exactly. Awesome. So this, this, your whole line of research reminds me of another... Uh, sort of idea that's, that's similar and probably related, uh, the placebo effect. Can you tell me about the placebo effect? What is it? The placebo effect is interesting, both historically and its mechanisms. The placebo effect really was publicized as a result of a paper, I think in 1955, by somebody named Beecher called The Powerful Placebo. And he didn't do any new research, but he evaluated existing literature and he showed that for a variety of treatment modalities about a third of the for a variety of different disease states about a third of the people that don't get treated get better mm. mm -hmm. and that's the widely cited statistic where about 30 or 33 percent of people who get a placebo get better so what do you mean by a placebo what's what's a placebo a placebo, well, a placebo can be anything. It could be uh, if, if the treatment is a, is a drug, a placebo can be something that looks like the drug but doesn't contain the active ingredient. Uh -huh. If the treatment consists of the uh, application of a machine like a hearing aid, yeah. a placebo would be an, in effect, you know, a, a, something that looks like that hearing aid. Not turned on. It, but not turned yeah, on. Yeah, I see. Know. Okay. Okay. So... So how does, the place, how does the placebo effect work? What's the mechanism that, well, the, that allows you to somehow I'm have the, a physiological reaction even though there is no active drug or substance? Well, we, when you say have a physiological reaction, the placebo effect is based on the patient's report of them feeling better, and that's to be distinguished from a physiological reaction. Mm -hmm. Although there are occasional isolated reports there are really not good studies that have stood up to replication that said that a placebo can have a physiological f effect in terms of producing tumor regression, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Or it, rather, placebo effects are seen primarily in two areas. Analgesia, that is pain, pain relief, yeah. the patient reports that they're in less pain. Mm -hmm. after. And depression, the patient reports that they're less depression. And these are all kinds of private symptoms they're only available to the patient. They're not available to anybody else outside the patient. And so the patient has to report on them. Uh, 
in terms of public symptoms, um, uh, blood pressure, or asthma symptoms, and things like that, placebo effects are much less pronounced. So let, me, let me tell you about an interesting study that was done recently where uh, patients who had asthma uh, had a, there's a drug that's, that's effective called albuterol, and if patients get albuterol, you can demonstrate that the symptoms are released by changes, for example, in respiratory volume. So if you give half, half your patient, well, they gave a third of the patients nothing, a third of the patients an albuterol inhaler, and a third of the patients a placebo inhaler that didn't have the active drug in it. And the patients that got the placebo inhaler reported they felt as good as the patients that got the mm -hmm. actual active ingredient inhaler, and both of them did better than the patients who got nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you actually measure respiratory volume, it was only the patients who got the active albuterol inhaler that performed better. So if the patient says they feel better, that's usually taken as evidence of the placebo effect. But often, if you measure whether they get better, and if you have some physiological index, like respiratory parameters, mm -hmm. then, then you will find that there is no placebo effect. Well, what does, it, what does it mean for something to be a real effect, though? So how would you react to someone who mm -hmm. said, well, um, even though you feel or you're reporting yeah. you have less depressive symptoms, yeah. you don't really have less depressive symptoms because I gave you a placebo. But that seems strange because I do have less. I am actually reporting you're feeling you're reporting. less. Well, and that people make mistakes, and their mistakes are understandable. Let me Let's, let, let's take the case of a physician that has to make a medical diagnosis. Suppose you come to the doctor and say, I have um, uh, pains in my pelvic area. Well, one possibility is, is appendicitis. And that would be terrible if, because if, if, if the appendix bursts, then your life is at risk. So you want to remove an inflamed, infected appendix. So you, you go through a lot of diagnostic tests and so on. You might say, well, gee, I, I never want to have unnecessary surgery, so I want to go to a physician that never, never removes hmm. a, a healthy appendix. You that might be what you think, but that's not what you want, because the, patient, the physician that never removes a healthy appendix simply doesn't have to, would always decide that you don't have appendicitis. Uh -huh. So you might say, well, I want to go to a physician that only removes diseased appendix. Yep. Well, you wouldn't want to do that because that physician is going to make some mistakes in, in terms of, he's going to have to be so sure that the appendix is diseased yep. that there'll be some diseased appendices that the physician's going to mix. So in fact, it turns out that even with the best diagnostic procedures, physicians that do appendix, appendix surgery are going to do unnecessary surgery 10 to 20 percent of the time. Hmm. Because, because, because they don't want to make the type of error which exactly. is to miss There are two a types burst. of mistakes. Yeah. And one type of mistake is horrendous, that is missing an affected yeah. appendix. The, under, the other type of mistake, that, that would be a, a, a false negative. The other type of mistake, a false positive, where the patient doesn't really have appendicitis, but you do the surgery. Well, that's pretty bad. You're doing unnecessary surgery, but it's not as bad as missing an inflamed appendix. Mm -hmm. So the we understand the physician can make a false positive errors when, when considering the costs and benefits of the different types of, of errors that they make. Well, now th the patient is in pain and gets a drug yeah. and, or gets a, a substance which the physician uh, assures the patient will alleviate the pain. Well, it's just like the physician had a hard time diagnosing the appendicitis, the patient has a hard time mm -hmm. deciding whether the pain or the depression or whatever is better or not. Yeah. They have, the pain is fluctuating in intensity. They have to somehow compare the current level of pain with some presumably arithmetic mean of the, of the pain in the recent past, average, how recent yeah, past. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very difficult decision to make. The patient 
if the patient, in fact, gets it inert substance, but doesn't know that, doesn't know whether they get an inert substance or placebo, then if they make one type of mistake, they'd be dis they, suppose they actually got an active ingredient, and if they said, I don't feel better, they'd be disputing the, the expertise of the physician, they might be um, uh, labeled a complainer, they might be prolonging their stay in the hospital. So there are pressures on the patient to are, respond that's right. positively. So a placebo effect for a patient is a false positive response, and it's that is mistakenly saying I feel better when I don't feel better. Mm -hmm. And it's as understandable as a false positive response that the clinician makes in diagnosing appendicitis in a patient. It's interesting. You said before that a placebo can be anything. Yeah. Uh, are there any factors that affect the strength of a placebo well, I, effect? I, I guess if the patient is more and more convinced that the substance that they get might be one with active ingredients because, for example, it's very expensive or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, comes from a bottle that looks like an orthodox medicine bottle yep. rather than... Or a big syringe. That's right. Yeah, I That's right. Yeah, okay. So but I don't want you to think that... that, that, that all placebo effects are simply false positive response. In fact, most of them, and all of them in Beecher's case in 1955, are explained by a much simpler mechanism, which is simply regression to the mean. That is, most people that are sick report, uh, approach a clinician, seek treatment mm -hmm. when they're sickest. Yeah. And most people who are sick get better. We'll get better anyway. And so, now we're back to homeostasis, it sounds like. So, <laughs> so because, because their homeostatic machinery, you're right, will, will uh, return them to health. Yeah. And so if, if you, so the people that get the placebo get better just because everybody, this because the majority of people who are sick get better and they just happen to get a placebo. And it's been pointed out since at least the 1990s, in order to really demonstrate a placebo effect, you need at least a three-arm study where one group gets a drug, one group gets a placebo, and a third group gets no treatment. And you have to find a difference between a placebo group and a no treatment group in order to assert a placebo effect. You can't just say that the placebo group got better. Can you unpack that for me a bit? So that sounds like a very complicated experiment or clinical trial. You're saying you need to look at the effect of, uh, of the drug and then of a placebo and then of a no, at the same time, no yeah. treatment. Yeah. So, right, so, yes. so can you tell me how, how adding each of those conditions allows you to say, have, make, make different conclusions about the experiment? Exactly. Imagine a group that um, is sick. Imagine a, a large group of people that are somehow equally in pain, equally distressed by pain. Yep. A third of them get a pain medication, and most of them get better. A third of them get an inert substance, and so there's some no, of them get no better. active ingredient. No or active yet. ingredient. A lot of them are going to get better just because whatever caused the pain healed oh. as a result of the passage of time. So. Is it the group that got the placebo? Did they get better because everybody, because because most people who get sick get better, or did they get better simply as a result of the passage of time? So you have a third group that was in pain, and and they're told, well, we're really busy now. We're going to have to schedule your appointment for two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. And if during that two-week pe period, there's about the same level of symptom relief in the waiting list group as in the placebo group, then the placebo group probably isn't really a placebo effect. It just reflects the fact that, that time uh, heals. Hmm. So I thought th that's, that's surprising to me because my intuition or my common understanding of the placebo effect was that if there is uh, nothing active and you get better, then it was a placebo effect. But you're saying that th that's not no. necessarily most the case. Most people who get nothing get better. I mean, that's, that's most of the things that afflict us, except the last thing, we, sur yeah. we survive. The last thing? Yeah, yeah. okay. See. My name is Shep. I think about anticipation. Uh -huh.